features Stephen Simon, music director of the Simon Symphonietta, whose ninth season begins this Saturday, September 15th. And along with this is Donna Kwong, a fabulous pianist from New York who's coming to play Saint-Saëns' second piano concerto. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me, let me just begin by saying that it's, it's such a pleasure being here, and thank you for um, inviting me to come play. And um, it was very exciting for me because um, I actually, I don't know if you even know this, but um, I first learned this concerto when I was about 10 years old. No. This is a very difficult concerto. <laughs> that was my, I, I think I was 10 or 11, and... You can't um, play this when you're 10 or 11. Well, I played it to the best of my abilities, let's put it that way. Um, and right. um, I ended up competing with this, this work, and, um, you know, I was, uh, it was a national competition, and I went, got to the finals, and it was in Canada, It was in right? Canada, yes. Oh. And I got to the finals, and it was my first time in a national competition, and I was getting all worked up, and I had to travel, and it was such a big deal, you know, to take a four-hour flight. But you were a little kid. I was, and my 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 father came with me. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, I remember distinctly practicing a lot. And there was, there was this one passage in the first movement, lots of octaves, and you know, yes. my hands are not big, but they're fully developed now. Back then, they were still developing, so um, I was really having trouble with all these octaves, and I just tensed up, and I just couldn't play them. Anymore. And I remember calling, I was in tears, yes. and my parents did not know what was going on, and I said, I just can't play this anymore, and I have to get this competition, and it's going to be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, calm down, just call your teacher, and it was probably like 10 p.m. And I called her crying, and she said, just relax, what you need to do is stop practicing. <laughs> said, well, that was certainly the right advice. So, yeah, it actually worked. Yes. I stopped thinking about it, I stopped tensing up whenever I got to that section, and then when I got to the competition and I played it, apparently um, uh, my parents were sitting with my teacher, and um, her, they said that my teacher's knees were shaking horribly when I was playing because I got to that part and I just played it so fast. Like, <laughs> And, but it was it was it worked out totally fine. So, so you could play it at the age. I I could yeah. play it. I could play it. So it, and it was a lot of fun. I'm glad to be able to revisit this work again. Well, we rise to the occasion. It's a terrible thing to say because it gives you not necessarily heralded uh, uh, nerves when you rise to the to the uh, the occasion. <laughs> We do. People do. Well, people do. I know. I but it's. I can't believe that they gave this to you to play when you were ten, though. Oh, you know, these days, seven-year-olds are playing Ravel, teenager concertos. So <laughs> <laughs> well, the interesting thing is, you probably looked six. Probably not. Actually, I was tall for my age. <laughs> 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 not so much anymore. Yes. So, well, we were thrilled to hear that this was a piece that was in your repertoire. I should say that we first met Donna in London this spring when she was recommended to us as a pianist for Carnival of the Animals, which we were recording with the London Philharmonic Orchestra for the Maestro Classic Series. And we had originally hired a duo piano team from London, and when we finally got around to listening to their performance of it, Stephen and I looked at each other and said, they sound old. <laughs> and at that point... <laughs> they were. And they were. Well, at that point, Stephen called his very good friend in New York, Susan Wadsworth, who's head of Young Concert Artists, which is the wonderful organization that gives professional management to up-and-coming young musicians. And it's been around for about 50 years now. And if you look at their roster, every great who is now anywhere between the ages of 20 and 70, has been a winner at YCA. And so Stephen, who has known Susan for 50 years, um, called her up and said, Susan, I have a problem. Um, do you have a duo piano team on your roster? And she said, well, actually, I don't. But I think I know two pianists who would be perfect for this. One is Donna Kwong, who's in New York. And the other is Wendy Chun, who's in Arizona. 
So we took a deep breath and we said, okay. And the two of them arrived in London. And by the time I heard them, four days later, I guess, sparks were flying and they were just fabulous and no one could believe that they hadn't been playing together for years. So this is our second Saint-Saëns adventure yeah. with Donna, which is really exciting. So the program begins with the Lynch Symphony. Yes. Now what I know about the Lynch Symphony is that it was written in four glorious days. After Can you Mozart, believe this? No computers? No printers, and it's going to be performed in four days. I know. He would spent three miserable months with his father and his new wife, whom his father hated. And then he arrives in Linz. Poor Costanza, really? She doesn't come out well in this all. Well, she? he arrived in Linz, and the Count invited him to stay. And obviously, the food was good, and the life was good, and out poured the symphony, which is really quite remarkable. But I'm sure you have things to say about it musically. Well. It doesn't get played very often. For, I don't know why this seems to be the program of works that have fallen under the radar. I think Sassel's too is under the radar, don't you? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah we, we have in our symphonic lexicon um, a number of great pieces of music that just don't get performed enough. Now, you would think that um, instead of keeping going back to the well, that those who are in charge of musical production for concerts would be able to be a little more original than what usually winds up on our concert programs across the country. But somehow that just doesn't seem to happen. I know for my part, and I take full blame for this because there's no one else to blame, um, I have never programmed these three works, certainly not together on one program. And I am thrilled with this evening's offerings because they are all great pieces of music and uh, which I have not performed on, well, we've only been in existence for nine years here in Falmouth. But, and that's not very often if you're playing three or four times a year. Uh, nonetheless, these are all new to our Falmouth audiences, and I'm really excited to be able to play them at uh, Falmouth Academy on this program. Now, the second work that's on the program really has an unbelievable number of brass and percussion instruments. So many, I understand, that the piano won't fit on the stage until they exit. Do you want to say something about the Hindemith? Sure. Um, I learned the Hindemith metamorphosis on themes by Carl Maria von Weber. Um, this was a composer, by the way, that Hindemith really enjoyed. He used to play piano duets that were written by Weber uh, with his wife. The other thing that you don't know is that Hindemith, used, when he was rehearsing, um, had his wife in the audience. E. Power Biggs did the same thing, the organist. The, who played on CBS for years and years and years and years when I was growing up. And um, his wife was in the audience too whenever uh, E. Power Biggs was rehearsing. When I was a freshman at Yale University School of Music, um, Hindemith, who was dean of the School of Music for many years, had just left the post and this was his sort of farewell concert. Um, I was a lowly piano student in the piano department, and we were all conscribed in order to make up the chorus for the Stravinsky Symphony of Psalms in the music school. And Hindemith conducted the program. So I actually conducted under the baton of Paul Hindemith. That said, um, his wife was in the audience, and Hindemith would turn around and say, how was it? And she was the arbiter of whether things were going well or not, and whether he had to change X, Y, or Z. And he relied entirely on her opinion. It was amazing. E. Power Biggs did the same thing. That's why I mentioned them in the same context. In any case, um, that was my one encounter with Paul Hindemith, and he wrote this piece based on themes that he used to play with his wife. Uh, the themes were from uh, Carl Maria von Weber's Ten. 
he actually was asked by a choreographer to write variations on these themes or arrangements on these themes from Carl Maria von Weber. And when he first submitted them, the choreographer came back and said, I really want to have it much closer to the original. And at that point, he said, well, <clears throat> thank you very much, and left, and then wrote his own version, which is the one you will hear tonight, which has been danced to. Balanchine actually choreographed it later on, you know, 20 years later or so. I didn't know that. Yes. Thank so, you for your research. Thank you. <laughs> um, and finally, we come to saint Saul's too, which I find it interesting, simply from a tempo point of view, that it begins slow. Usually you have fast, slow, fast. But this begins slow, and then gets faster, and then, of course, you go up in a cloud of smoke in the end. Yeah. Not, not, not literally, we hope. No. I hope not, although that would be for a very dramatic It would, it would be memorable. Production. Yes, it would. <laughs> well, first of all, what's so amazing about this piece is you would never believe that it was written by Camille Saint-Saëns. As a matter of fact, I am always amazed at what is written it composed by Camille Saint-Saëns, aside from the Carnival of the Animals, because he always sounds different. It's very true. Um, he lived a very long time. I mean, he's just, he's born just after Beethoven dies, and he lives all the way up to the time of Ravel and Satie and Debussy, whom he hated. I think Faure studied him. Yes, yes. Faure was one of his, his favorite pupils. So, Anyway, it begins sounding like Johann Sebastian Bach. You can't forget, it, if you ever knew, that Sassons was a great organist. And he was the organist at La Madeleine, which was one of Paris's most famous churches. And people would come and hear him play Sunday Mass from all across Europe in order to hear the master play the organ. So I suppose it's not so shocking to hear the beginning of this piano concerto sounding like Bach. But it's not. It's Saint-Saëns. The only other thing that I think one should say is Saint-Saëns was a prodigious pianist himself. He talks about having studied as a child with a teacher who insisted that he keep his arms on a board so that he would only have the strength of his fingers. But when you hear things like the Carnival of the Animals or this concerto, you realize what a pianist he was. So, would you give us the treat? Sure. Um, actually, this is the very opening, the unusual opening, um, it's, and it's sort of a throwback, I think, and it um, is very much like Bach. Oh, let me try here. 
Um, well, I, um, I live in New York now, and um, I've been living there since um, I studied at Juilliard. I'm not going to do the year. Um, but I did get my, I got my bachelor's and master's um, from Juilliard, and um, I had a fantastic time um, you know, learning from such great, not just great teachers, but all my peers and my, you know, all fellow students and everything. Um, and, um, but before that, um, I actually grew up in Vancouver, Canada. And um, I spent, you know, a lot of time there playing the piano and competing and whatnot. And um, when, it, you know, people ask me all the time, oh, did you know from an early age that you were going to do this, you know, for the rest of your life? And, and I said, well, no, not really. <laughs> it was a big part of my life. Um, but it wasn't until my senior year of high school when I had to pick which school was to go to and whatnot um, that I thought, well, at first I thought I would double major and, um, in psychology and music, but then I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to, with something like music where so much work has to be done outside of the classroom, um, I didn't think I could give it 100%. And so I said, well, if I'm not going to give music 100%, like, I don't see the point in developing this. So I said, well, I'm going to do that. And if that doesn't work out, then I'll have something else later on. Because I still have my brain, hopefully. <laughs> um, so that's how I ended up with my decision to pursue a career in music. May I ask, how many hours a day were you practicing your senior year in high school? I actually, well, let me start by answering your question. Um, probably about six hours a day, and um, one might ask how I found the time to even do that. How did you find the time to even do that? Thank you. Um, actually, I went to a school that, um, it was just a regular public school, but it also had a special program within it. So it was, um, so it was the, the program for the, um, what was it called? Sports and Performing Arts. So there were actually more people in the sports in this program than in the performing arts, but there were certainly a lot of musicians and lots of dancers and swimmers and tennis players, you know, very serious people. So I actually ended up get going to school just in the mornings and um, then getting the rest of the day to train or go to my lessons or my lessons. So that's how, that's what yeah, I did. That's how it was possible. That's, a, that's how it was possible. Yes. Um, now I've, you know, I now I've learned how to practice better. So mm -hmm. I actually, thinking back to the six hours I did, I could probably do that work in probably two hours, two or three hours. So it's all about efficiency, of course. Um, but after, actually, after I finished, um, actually, my fourth year at Juilliard, um, I started playing in an ensemble. Um, it was a piano trio, and um, the violinist and cellist um, are identical twins. And um, we just started together as a student group, and we said, hey, we like each other, our musical styles seem to gel, and our working style seems to... Um, you were compatible. Very compatible, because it's not just about being able to play well together. You have to be able to work together. Yes. Um, and that's a huge part of it. And so we wanted to get some credit for, for school, for our degrees. So got together and we went to a summer festival. Actually, we went to Norfolk, the summer sure. school uh, for, the, yeah. for Yale School of Music. And uh, we spent a summer there and there were coaches there who said, you know, you should really um, try out for young concert artists. And we said, what, what's that? <laughs> and, and you know, it was this great organization, the hobby had started. We had these coaches who really believed in our future together. And we hadn't actually thought of staying together for a very long time. We just sort of got into it and said, okay, whatever. And uh, so we said, okay, sure, we'll look into it. And we looked through the, you know, the brochure for the, for the applications. Yeah. They didn't have a category for, for piano trio. They had you know, one for an, every major instrument and, you know, vocals. Chamber music. They didn't even have, they really? didn't even have chamber music. And um, so we said to one of these coaches who, who, you know, encouraged us to apply, we said, well, what's what's the deal? We, there's no category for this. 
this. And he said, let me just call Susan Wadsworth, and I'll, I'll see if I can get you an audition. So he did, and she agreed to it. And so we thought, oh, OK, here we go. And at that point, we hadn't been together for very long. Like one, school, one school year and a summer for six weeks. You know, and you know, it wasn't that much. And then, okay, another semester, and then we had to take the auditions in New York, and it was a it was a great process for us. Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up winning, which we really couldn't <laughs> <laughs> When they actually, when they announced the winners, and we were just so worked up from you know just the tension of waiting, the anticipation, and when they announced one of the winners was Claire Montreal, that was the name of the group. At, Named after the street Named outside the of Juilliard? Street, outside of the old, they had the old Juilliard. Juilliard. Right, sure. Um, we just sort of sat there. <laughs> and nobody had told us where, to, nobody had said where we were supposed to go. And then they were looking out from the stage and saying, where, where are where you? Are you here? <laughs> are you here? And so we just sort of stumbled on stage and said, like, OK, we're here. Um, and I remember distinctly um, signing the contract with young concert artists. And I mean, that organization, organization is just so wonderful. And you know, it's such a nurturing environment mm. for young artists to start out. And you know, we signed a contract, and we sat there, and we looked at each other, and said, you know, I think we just got married. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So for those who don't know, Young Concert Artists provides professional management for how many years? I think three. it was three. three yeah. And then the goal is to move you towards um, commercial management. And we ended up doing that. Um, but I have to say, you know, and, and then the group, I stayed with the group for 12 and a half years. Ooh. And it was a very long time, and we played a, a lot of concerts. Like we, had, we had traveled to most of the United States, including we played in Hawaii, we played in Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. And there were only a couple of states that we missed. Um, and that was t t 12 and a half years ago, or 12, for 12 and a half years. And um, it wasn't until um, January of this past year that I, I had to make a very big decision. Um, it was a family decision, basically, because um, I, I have a baby daughter. And I wanted Who's to Who is now? She is now 19 months, um, a very energetic 19 months. <laughs> and um, I made the decision to leave the group. Um, it was a very difficult decision for me, but I left um, because I felt like I wanted to stay home a little bit more um, to spend the time with my family. Well, we are delighted you made but that decision. Yeah. Because if you hadn't, who knows, you wouldn't have been able to do Carnival of That's the That's actually very true. And you probably wouldn't have been able to do this day even, I might so have been very, very busy. <laughs> <laughs> the Simon Timonietta's ninth season opens with a concert on Saturday, September 15th at 7:30 p.m. at Falmouth Academy. The next concert will be Saturday, February 16th at Falmouth Academy at 7:30, and it will feature music by Handel, Bach, and Mendelssohn.